Good evening, everybody. This is Juan Ocasio. I'm the pastor and the founder for the House of Truth Christian Ministries. Welcome one more time to our weekly prophetic update and Bible studies. Today, the subject is so important nowadays. It's important for the end times church. It's important for this world in the end times. And it's more important to each one of us who are called to minister unto God as a watchman. Yes, I feel blessed to be anointed as a watchman. At the moment, I understood my purpose in life. Once I gave my life unto my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, He anointed me with this uh, goal, with this commission, to be a watchman, to see the world events, to pay attention to what surrounds us, to all the things that are being passed by, to all these news that don't make necessarily to mainstream, but they're so critical in understanding the times we're in. We're in dangerous times, in perilous times, as the Apostle Paul said and wrote to Timothy, which is recorded on 2nd of Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Perilous and dangerous times we're living. Watchman, sound alarm. What is a watchman, you may ask? In the Holy Word of God, in the Holy Bible, there are two words used. One in the Hebrew Aramaic scriptures, usually called the Old Testament, and the Koine Greek scriptures, which is called the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the word for watchman is sephar, which is to look out or to look about. To spy or to keep watch and watch expectantly. Watch expectantly. Keep that in your mind. And in Greek, the word is scopos. Scopos, where the English word scope comes from, means to watch as an end marker, to watch for a goal or to watch aimed at something like a goal. It's very important that we understand the meaning of the word watchman in the Bible because we're going to be talking about the functions, duties, and reasons why we do what we do in the Lord as watchmen. And in order to understand the duties and responsibilities which is intrinsically tied to our calling as ministers uh, unto the Lord, the lives and livelihoods of all hangs in the balance whether people react or don't react to the preaching of the message of the gospel of the good news. Jesus commissioned us to preach the good news. Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 says, and this gospel or good news of the kingdom shall be preached in all nations then the end shall come and then the end shall come emphasis on mine the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God is so important that will bring the end of this world which lies under the power of the wicked one like the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, The God of this world, little g, little God, the God of this world has blinded the, the eyes and the ears of the unbelievers. So they don't receive the good news of the gospel of Christ. Let's go to the Bible. Let's go and all honor belongs to the Father and to the Son and the, and the Holy Spirit. And I thank God that He allows us to say this message to do to you in this time of very high importance. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 2. In Ezekiel chapter 2, we're going to see what Ezekiel, the prophet of God, whose book is named after, what he received from God, and why is that so important to apply these principles onto the watchmen of the end times. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. 
and he see it, it reads and he said unto me that is God son of man stand upon thy feet and I will speak unto thee and the spirit entered in me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet that I heard him that spake unto me and he said unto me son of man I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me they and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day in the chapter 1 Ezekiel has a vision of the glory of the Lord the appearance of the glory of God he sees the seraphims he sees the wheels he sees the sea of glass he sees that of the presence of God there's fire and a rainbow and things undescribable in human terms about the beauty and the glory of God but it's no time for Ezekiel to ponder in the beauty and the greatness of God and the magnificency of heaven because God has commissioned him to go to Israel he's a prophet to the nation of Israel and now he has to go back to Jerusalem he has to go back to the nation to send them a message that Israel has for so long and their kings and their priests and their Levites and the nation have transgressed against the Lord they have ignored the laws of God they have involved themselves in abominable acts in idolatry in the sacrifice of children unto false gods to the worship of the Sun and of Tammuz and of the nature and of the creatures but they have neglected and they have forgotten the Creator, the Lord of Heaven, the Maker of Heaven and Earth and everything that is contained in them. They have forsaken the true worship of God. And God is sending Ezekiel to address the nation. And on verse 4, he describes them as stiff-necked and stubborn. They were stubborn from day one since they were pulled out with strong hand out of the slavery out of bondage of Egypt and they brought in the promised land a land that flows with milk and honey they crossed the Red Sea they saw what God did for them and the Red Sea how Pharaoh and his armies perished in the Red Sea once they tried to cross the Red Sea after Israel how God provided those ten plagues that humiliated every single God of Egypt because they were proven to be false and dead gods while their Lord is a living God the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob yet they did not turn from the evil ways and time and after time after time they sinned against God by their pride by their greed by the contempt against the things of God and even in the brink of destruction by King Nebuchadnezzar the king of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians the city of Jerusalem lies in siege the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judah and of Benjamin and the temple people which were the Levites forgot how God punished the ten northern tribes with their capital in Samaria which split from Jerusalem under the rules of Jeroboam and Jeroboam yet they ignore that God had to let these ten tribes go into exile by the Assyrian Empire now they see that the armies of Nebuchadnezzar approached Jerusalem and during the times of the ministry of Jeremiah Jeremiah spoke with Jehoiakim and he told them he must surrender to the king of Babylon if he want to leave and the nation not be destroyed but he did not hearken to the words of God through Jeremiah he listened to all the other prophets so-called prophets that we have today prophets that prophesy prosperity and other things that prophesy lies because there's not they're not speaking the will of God and here we see that Ezekiel after seeing the magnificence of God he is sent by God himself in his spirit to preach to a rebellious nation that for hundreds of years have forsaken God that just a few kings like Je uh, Jehoshaphat and Josiah and David love God and 
try their best to maintain the people clean and away from immorality and away from idol worship, witchcraft and all those sins. But now God sent him. In, in verses 5 and 6, God tells Ezekiel not to be afraid of them. Not to be afraid of the Israelites. No matter what they say or no matter how they look against Ezekiel, God is with Ezekiel and Ezekiel will deliver the message of God. He will not dismay, he will not be afraid. And that's a word of advice to us watchmen today in the end times, but I'll talk about that later. A word of warning from God to Ezekiel, do not do rebellious as the nation is rebellious. You will do what I told you to do. You will deliver my words on, onto this nation. And uh, as a parenthesis, if we read the book of Jonah, when God sent Jonah to pray against Nineveh because the wickedness of Nineveh was of so, uh, such a degree that he was about to uh, erase Nineveh from the earth. Just like God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and all those nations because of their immorality and their pride and the abundance of bread and all the cruelty. God was about to destroy Nineveh, but God sent a prophet of Israel, but Jonah disobeyed God and he went to Tarshish. Uh, long story short, he still had to do what the Lord commissioned him to do. And the people of Nineveh repented from the king down to the lowest man and they were forgiven for that time so Ezekiel did well in hearkening or listening to the words of God because he was going to a stiff neck nation he knew how perverse the Israelites became how corrupt spiritually and ethically and morally they have become how low they sank in the filth of sin worse than the nations around them so Ezekiel will not be afraid and he should not be troubled by the appearance of what they say against his ministry because God will be with them let's read verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2 of Ezekiel listen carefully and I and when I looked that's Ezekiel speaking behold an hand was sent unto me and lo a roll of a book was therein and he spread it before me and it was written within and without, that means in the front and in the back, and there was written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. So now Ezekiel say, sees this hand with a roll that is open and is written in the front and in the back, and Ezekiel now receives that book or scroll from the hand of God. Look at uh, what verses uh one and two of chapter three of ezekiel happens and he reads moreover he said unto me son of man eat that thou findest eat this roll and go speak unto the house of israel so i opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll and look at what happened in verse three and he said unto me son of man cause thy belly to eat and fill the bowels with this roll that i give thee then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. After God told them to do something awkward, to eat a book, a parchment, a roll, a scroll, if you will, Ezekiel did obey God and ate it, and it was sweet in his mouth, sweet as honey. And God said, after he ate that, he in the following verses God said go talk to the people of Israel and speak my words unto them because Israel is not a nation of a strange language because if the words that Ezekiel was going to preach to Israel were said to another nation of a different language these nations will have repented but God knew that they will either hear or forbear the message that was sent through Ezekiel and that comes to my mind the times of Jesus ministry in Galilee and Judea when Jesus uh, went to preach to the cities of Chorazin to the cities of Bethsaida to the city of Capernaum and he did miracles and Jesus was flabbergasted by their lack of faith in Jesus 
They did not acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. They did not see him as the Son of God or divine. They ignored his ministry. Jesus said very clearly in the gospel that if these miracles and wonders were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, these cities will have remained till today. And remember, Sodom and Gomorrah, two angels went to get Lot and his family out. And they caused blindness and they brought fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed those cities and the district of Jordan. Jesus is comparing that the words that he spoke and the miracles that he performed in these cities will have caused the perverse cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to remain here. Even Tyre and Sidon will have remained. But Capernaum will be reduced to hell and all the other cities will be having worse judgment in the last day, in the, in the end times, in the day of judgment, than the cities that were famously perverse, like Sodom and Gomorrah and Tyre and Sidon. A point to ponder. So, Ezekiel had to go and preach the gospel. He said that in verses 7 and 8 and 9, that even if their foreheads or their faces are tough or strong against Ezekiel, his face and his forehead will be like flint, like adamant flint, that he will be strengthened, he will be hotter, he will be stronger. And that comes into remembrance the words of the Apostle Paul that says, Stronger is he that lives in me, which is the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world. And John said the same. So when we are sent as watchmen to preach the, the message, not just of reconciliation, but the message of judgment from God, and the, uh, we announce the day of the wrath of God and the Lamb. People may not want to hear it. People may oppose the message. People in church also will oppose the message. They might not like the message. They might even try to tell us to soften up the message. To make it look warm or deluded because they can take it. But our faces on our foreheads will be strong. That means our minds will be ironclad in the gospel in the dispensation of the gospel of the kingdom of God and preaching about the upcoming judgment of the wrath of God and the Lamb to this wicked mankind and to this lukewarm church and to this uh, fallen Israel that still denied the real Messiah which is Christ Jesus so we have no reason to be afraid neither of brethren or non brethren or enemy or foe we don't have a reason to be afraid because the God of heaven is with us he anointed us to be watchmen and he will see us through that we deliver the message and is taken whether people hear or forbear. For, uh, by the way, the word forbear in Hebrew is shadeo, which means to refuse. The message of Ezekiel, either the people of Israel will listen to it or will refuse it. But they will know that a prophet was sent unto them, just like Jeremiah. Just like so many other prophets that were woke up early, like Isaiah, to preach to them, to tell them to repent from the evil ways, to return back to God and the true worship, to the true holiness which is found in God. Be ye holy as I am holy, God said many and many times. And Israel refused to bow down to God, yet they killed the prophets and everybody that God sent to them. Uh, Jesus said this very clearly in the Gospels when he addressed the Pharisees, when he addressed the Sadducees and the scribes and the masters and teachers of the law. He called us vipers and hypocrites because they are the descendants of those who kill the prophets. It is so important that God gave this message that Ezekiel had to tell them. Verse 11 says, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, whether they will accept the message or they will refuse it. And we still bless the Lord. It's interesting that on uh, chapter 3, verse 17, look at what the Lord says. Son of man, God telling, telling to uh, Ezekiel, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. 
watchmen used to be stationed in the towers that were in between the walls of the cities not just in Jerusalem but all the other cities if you see the Great Wall of China there are towers where guards used to stand there if you go to Puerto Rico in the castle they're called garitas or guard houses where soldiers used to be there to stand guard to be alert at all times whether it was day whether it was night they had to pay close attention if their enemies coming or there's a storm coming or there's problems coming or pirates coming or invaders coming they had to sound the alarm the chapter 3 of Ezekiel uh, tells us what God expects the watchmen to do whether the people abide to the warning or not in a summary if the watchman does not warn the wicked and the wicked die in his own wickedness the blood of that wicked person who died in his own iniquity the blood will be claimed at the head of the watchman who did not warn but if the watchman warned the wicked and the wicked turned from his evil ways and repented and restored what he stole and does what is lawful and right in the eyes of God he will live and the watchman will have delivered his soul however on, on the other hand if the watchman has and sees a righteous man who start doing things that are wicked or committing an iniquity and he does not warn the righteous so he can turn back to his righteousness the righteous man will die and the righteousness that he did before will never be remembered and the blood of that righteous man that turned wicked will be claimed to the watchman who did not warn him but if the watchman did warn him and the righteous man stays righteous the righteous shall live and the watchman will have delivered his own head he did his responsibility he warned both the wicked and the righteous the voice of God for the righteous stay in the righteousness of God and for the wicked repent from your sins and turn away from them and go back to God. That's the mission of the watchman, just like Ezekiel was. In a nutshell, the responsibilities or duties of a watchman is to keep watch in expectation or looking towards a goal, to warn against sin and to declare the will of God because he was sent by God, he's anointed by the Spirit of God, and God gave you strength and courage to carry on your mission. The watchman warns the wicked to repentance and to change conversion and warns the righteous to keep faithfulness and to stay righteous in the eyes of God that's the whole in a nutshell the duties of a watchman whether they hear or they forbear whether they listen or they refuse the message that is the job of the watchman Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 27 says in the last part thus saith the Lord God he that heareth let him hear and he that forbeareth let him forbear for they are a rebellious house this is a parallel to something that is written in the book of Revelation I'll read to you later we are going now to Ezekiel chapter 33 uh, Ezekiel chapter 33 is basically another passage about the commission of the watchman in this case on the case of Ezekiel but it applies to the modern day watchman the end times watchman the preacher that preaches repentance in the name of Jesus and see the world events taking place and falling according to the Bible prophecy and how it's applied to the church to Israel and to the world chapter 33 I'm gonna read the first verses uh, uh, verses 1 um, to 6 and bear with me Ezekiel 33 1 to 6 uh, uh, says and he says again the word of the Lord came unto me saying son of man speak to the children of thy people and say unto them when I bring the sword upon a land if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman here it goes if when he sees the sword come upon the land he blow the trumpet and warn the people then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning if the sword come and take him away his blood shall be upon his own head 
He heard the sound of the trumpet and took that warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Verse 6. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Again, the summary of the functions of a watchman. If they see the sword or see calamity coming, they have to sound the trumpet. They sound the alarm to wake up the people either to fight or to defend. Verse 7 says, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee as a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Again, God is commissioned Ezekiel as a watchman to, unto the uh, people of Israel and he has to hear the words of God, keep it in his heart and speak the words of God and nothing else. That is his whole duty, to warn both the wicked to repentance, whether he repents or not, and to the righteous to maintain righteousness. And if he turns into wicked, whether he abides to, to the warning or not, the watchman must carry out his duties to warn about the will of God and about the danger that the nation is facing. Amen and amen. Chapter 33 tells everything that pertains about the wicked and the righteous and the consequences for listening or not listening or the consequences to the watchman if he warns or doesn't warn the people when he sees the problem. Now, let's scroll in the Bible a little further ahead and we're going to talk about a contemporary of Ezekiel and that was the prophet Habakkuk. Back uh, his book is a little after Nahum and Daniel and Hosea and Amos and the book of Habakkuk give us more information because Habakkuk also was a prophet and he was a psalmist he was also a singer so the prophet Habakkuk in the chapter 1 he is weary about all the wickedness and all all the wicked things the people of Israel were doing verses 3 and 4 and he asked God how long are you gonna make me see this how more how long I have to see the spoiling the violence and the strife and the law that is like that means they don't they don't obey the law they don't fear the law and the judgment does never go forth for the wicked does compass around the righteous and the wrong judgment is wrong And then he sees the vision of God raising the Chaldeans or the Babylonians against Jerusalem. And he does exactly just like Ezekiel, warning the people of Israel to repent and to turn to the God of his ancestors. Who shall deliver them, but even if they continue stiff-necked or stubborn against God, God will send them to destruction and to exile, which did happen. Look at what chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 says about the attitude of Habakkuk and about a vision that he saw. Chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 says, I will stand upon my watch. Do you see that? I will. It's a decision from Habakkuk. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. That's God. And what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that read it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, that means the future. But at the end, at the end it shall speak and not lie. Through it tarry, or even if it's delayed, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And then God explained that the just will live by faith. Habakkuk is as important as Ezekiel and he as a prophet sent to Israel to his own compatriots he said I will stand in my watch and he will see what the Lord will tell and the answer that he'll be 
give to his reproof. God will question, did you sound the alarm? Did you warn my people? Did you compel them to repentance? And the watchman better be ready to give an answer. It is such a big responsibility for us watchmen in the end times that our blood is in our own heads. If we don't warn the world and if we don't warn the church, if we don't warn the people of Israel and compel them to repent, that's a storm coming. And there's a big storm coming. I have said it before in the videos that I have posted. The day of the Lord, the great and terrible day of the wrath of God who sits on the throne and the Lamb approaches. Isaiah said that the, it says that the dead by the Lord will be from one end of the world to the other. They will not bury nor mourn. Upon the rapture that happens on this church, on our church, praise be to God for His great mercy that He will spare us from the hour of temptation. And who will spare us from the wrath to come. Still we are commanded to preach unto the people the message of repentance. Just like John the, uh, the Baptist and Jesus the Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, they preach a message of repentance. Repent and turn away from your sins and come back to the Lord. For He is merciful because in Ezekiel says that God does not delight in the death of the wicked, but from the wicked to turn away from His evil ways, to turn from it so they don't perish. Jesus said that he came by the love of God. So anyone whosoever believed in the Son of God, that is him himself, the Christ, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But the message of the watchman is not just the good stuff. It's not just the sweet stuff. It's not the easy stuff. For us, uh, the labor is so hard because we have to say what people don't want to hear. That we're telling people to repent, just like we repented, they have, they have to repent if they want to see life, if they want to see eternity, if they don't want to spend their lives in hell and then the lake of fire because their names are not written in the book of life. Watchmen, sound the alarm, sound the alarm right now. The world is lost. America is fallen. Europe is fallen. And they're all falling and collapsing and crumbling morally, religiously, financially, politically, societally. All the countries of the world are in turmoil from little islands to mega powers. They're all in turmoil. They're collapsing because there's a new world all rising which is anti-Christian, which is anti-God. And it's our duties on watchmen to warn the world, stop what you're doing. Compel them to come to God, for God is merciful, slow to anger, and quick to forgive. But because He's holy, He has to exert His justice and His holiness upon a filthy and unrepentant world that veers away from God more and more and more, who have bought in the lies of the devil, who have bought in the lies of the Satan, the opposer of God. That have paid attention to doctrines of devils, especially the church that is so lukewarm today that does not resemble the little church that was in the first century when the Lord walked the earth. We have to compel the people to repent. We have to tell the people the day of the wrath approaches, just like Joel chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 says. Jesus prophesied. What was written in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and in the book of John, and in the book of Revelation, all the calamities that the earth will face because they have ignored the Lord. They have pledged allegiance to the Antichrist, which is the beast and the false prophet who will perform miracles and wonders and whatever things they plan to do to deceive the nations. Jesus gave us forewarning. But he told us that we still had to preach the gospel, that we still had to preach for the lost soul, for the sick and the elderly and the ones that had defects and those who are being rejected and those who have a low self-esteem, those who are the castaways, those who rebel against the parents but they don't know any better. But we can show them the way to God which is through Christ Jesus. And our testimony just 
do a reinforcing of what the gospel already says. Isaiah chapter 21 verse 8 says, My Lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower, continually. We don't neglect this so vital a job as a watchman. We stand continually upon the watchtower that in the daytime, and I am saying in my word all nights. As the world grows darker and darker spiritually, the watchmen of God stand watch. We watch and pray, but we watch and speak. We just not pray, but we also preach and we teach and we rebuke and we reprove and we exhort and we tell and compel the people in the highways and hedges, the people in the church who are not in the church because they have not yet given their life to Christ and the people in the world who are in the outside in the darkness, we have to tell them and compel them and we are the salt and we are the light of the world and we have to compel them to come back to Christ to come Christ, to know Christ, to repent to repent, to repent, to turn away, to change, to convert to Christ abandon the sins of this world just like we did But the watchman can do this job alone. Psalm 127 verses 1 and 2 says, Except the Lord, which is God, keeps the city, the watchman who watches, watches in vain. So if I'm a watchman for the Lord and not doing the, the will of God, and I'm not paying attention to the world events, I'm not studying in the, in the Bible, in the Holy Word, and I don't seek the face of God, and I don't warn the people, what's the purpose of me being a watchman when the Lord is not with me? We have to count on the support from the Holy Spirit from God. Jesus said, I'll be with you all the way until the end of the age, until the end of the world. We can always ask for support. Lord, give me courage. Lord, give me a boldness to uh, uh, preach the gospel. Lord, give me strength to speak the words and to say it in a way that will convey your message. And not my own. So I can be removed. And you are the one doing the speaking through me. So they will know in the last days. In the end days. When the Lord comes. When the church is taken. And when he comes to accept. Assert the justice and vengeance. Upon the ones that took the mark of the beast. And those who don't obey the gospel. They will say. There was a preacher. There was a watchman. There was somebody who warned me. But I ignored them. I, 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 uh, I, for, uh, I refuse to listen. These things that the prophet is seeking on the back went through. In the times of Israel. It's a lesson that we have to learn. Because in the near future. Let's go to the book of Revelation. The last book of the Bible. In Revelation, in the chapter number 10, we're going to see a great vision that Apostle John, the beloved Apostle, saw that the Lord allowed him to see things that will happen in the future at the time of the coming of His Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Before I read the frame of circumstances that this event takes place, is shortly after the angels blast or blow the first six of the seven trumpets of God. Before that, the seven seals of God were opened by the Lamb, which is Jesus, that unleashes the Antichrist, that unleashes war, that unleashes famine, and unleashes death and hell upon all the earth. And earthquakes and hail and, and voices and the incense and the prayers of the, of, of the faithful were thrown down. On the earth we see that the first six trumpets that were blown and I'm just a, a quick fire here shows the wrath of God on the land being poured out with a mixture on this earth and the church was taken away the church was raptured what remains is the remnant of Israel the 144,000 preaching the gospel and they have the seal of God on the foreheads because we were sealed by the Holy Ghost but these 144,000 men virgin from the 12 tribes of Israel are preaching the gospel at the world stage angels go with them but look at what in a quick fire the trumpets do 
The first trumpet when it was blown, hail, fire, blood mingled, fell on earth, and the third part of the trees and the grass and everything green burned. The second trumpet was blown, and a mountain, a great mountain burning, fell into the sea, and the third part of all sea life was perished, and all the three, uh, a third part of all the vessels and seas, uh, ships made by man were destroyed. The third blast brings a great star falling from heaven that is burning, and it falls on the fresh waters in the rivers and the bodies of water that are fresh, and the star is called Wormwood, and the waters turn Wormwood, very bitter, and a lot of people die. On the fourth trumpet, a third of the sun, and the third of the moon, and the third of the stars were darkened. So out of 12 hours during the day, and of the 12 hours of the night, out of the 12, eight hours half day or night because the sun and the moon has been darkened if the sun is darkened of course the moon cannot reflect the light of the sun and the days and nights lost a third of their light what happens when there's very little output of the sun the planet gets cold there's an angel that says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth for the reason of the three trumpets that are uh, still about to be blessed. The fifth trumpet opened an angel that fell from heaven. He got the key of the bottom of the speed that opened it, and, uh, and the locusts, uh, demonic locusts, come out of the bottom of the speed and start tormenting man for five months people will wish to die but they can die because these locusts are stinging them they are hurting them they will seek death the, the, the locusts are not authorized to kill but people will not die even if they try they will be tormented for five for five months and their master or the king is an angel called Abaddon and Apollyon it's a demon strong demon and when the sixth trumpet is blown there's an army a hellish army of 200 million mounting on horses that are apocalyptic ugly and terrible and they kill a third of mankind with fire smoke and brimstone or if they get they get bitten by the tails they get hurt as well these things are going to happen, people. If we run the numbers of the people that live on the earth right now, we're close to 8 billion people. On the omission of the second seal of, of, of the Lamb, from the hand of the Lamb, it unleashes war, and a quarter of the people were killed by wars and pestilence and by the beasts of the earth. So if we're counting around roughly about eight people, we're talking about two billion people will perish when the second seal is broken. So first of all, first and second world war and all the wars combined will pale compared to what's coming people. Some preachers say, oh, it's gonna get better, it's gonna get better. No, it's a lie because it's gonna get much, much worse for those who are not sealed by God. So out of eight billion, two billion will perish. So uh, uh, at the time of the blast of the sixth trumpet, when 200 million army will destroy a third of mankind, remember out of 8 billion, two were already destroyed by war, so 6 billion remain, if they kill a third, 2 billion more will be taken away. So that will remain 4 billion people, and even those 4 billion people will not repent and will not come back to God because they are worshiping the devil, they're worshiping the, the, the beast and his image and have received the mark and they will receive undiluted the wrath of God. So now we can go to chapter 10 of Revelation and chapter 10 verses 1 to 4 and read And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. 
Uh, he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, and when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered the voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered the voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And we see this strong, super powerful angel lifted up his hands and, and swore by him that liveth forever and ever whose God. And he said that time will be no longer, verse 6 says. So man has lived by time. We have marked time and diseases ever since Adam started dying. But before Adam, there was no time, it was eternity. And when the Lord restore all things, He will go back to eternity in the purpose God purpose and set to be. So with this strong angel says time will be no more. Once the judgment and the wrath of God and the Lamb is poured down and He says it's finished, time will cease. And verse 7 says that in the days that when the seventh angel, angel blows the seventh uh, trumpet, the mystery of God should be finished. Uh, he has declared to His servants the prophets. So verse 8, one of the creatures still, um, John, to go and get the, the book, the scroll that the angel has. And verse 9 says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Verse 10, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. The same case as the prophet Ezekiel. When he ate the scroll, it was sweet in his stomach, but he went to preach in the bitterness and the zeal of God. Because he was sending a bitter message. And a bitter message is not easily received. And John is going to go through the same. He has to eat a scroll that contains a purpose of God. And he, he was sweet because it's, it's a delight for the righteous to do the will of God. And to be instructed in the ways of God. To learn from God and to follow the direction of God. It's something sweet. But bitter at the same time. Because now according to verse 11. It's written and he said unto me. Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. It's a bitter message. We've been preaching for 2,000 years and in these past few years, we, the watchmen of God, we've been, we've been preaching repentance, repentance, repentance. We've been trying to expunge the scriptures or to people to let them understand we are, are living in the last days. Just like Jesus said, just like the apostles said, just like the prophets said. And, and they, uh, we don't want them to be destroyed because the grace and the love and the patience of God has been so that He has allowed all this wickedness so that the message of the gospel can reach as many as possible before the end so people can make a conscious decision whether to uh, reprove or, or forbear or accept the message. And if they accept the message, we have done our job. And he have warned the wicked, and they refuse it, they forbear it, we have done our job. We will have saved our heads, even if we lose our lives in this world. Jesus said that the church, that the people of God will be hated by all nations. There's no exception. Because Paul said all who wants to live godly in this world will be hated and persecuted. Amen. John ate of that scroll. It was sweet to him. And it was bitter in his stomach. He had to yet go again and preach the, the message. That's a message of the revelation of uh, Jesus Christ. That's a message that we have to keep preaching. The Lord is coming. We say that kingdom come that will be done. Daniel 4, 2, 44 said that the Lord heaven will establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Will never pass through another, uh, uh, another people. And he will judge and he will rule forevermore. That is a kingdom of such holiness that the wicked will not enter. The wicked cannot stand in the presence of the Lord. 
flesh and blood cannot be in the presence of God unless, much less, a sinful, willingly sinful person cannot be in the presence of the Lord. It's our job as watchmen to sound the alarm. Let them know, hey, the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Repent, prepare, get ready. The Lord is coming with judgment and a strong hand. Revelation 19 said that Jesus comes as King of kings and Lord of the Lord. Uh, he will destroy the nation with the sword that comes out of his mouth. And in justice and righteousness and in holiness he judges. Jesus said very clearly uh, when he came to the uh, to earth to preach the gospel. He didn't come to, to, to condemn the world then. But if you did not believe in the Son of God, you already condemned. Right now, a lot of people, our friends, co-workers, strangers, people in the entertainment business, in the sports industry, even in the military, uh, in the news, they don't believe the gospel. They ridicule us. They insult us. They persecute us. They try to limit uh, uh, how much we can say or how far we can go. Or they want us to liquefy or dilute the preaching of the gospel because they don't want to hear about sin, they don't want to be hear, uh, want to hear about hell, they want to hear about the lake of fire, they don't want to hear about God's judgment, they don't want to hear that God will not allow anyone in heaven that is not a sinner, that has not been washing the blood of His Son. But people don't want to hear that. They want to hear, oh, okay, I'll give you money, shut up, and keep going. Or tell me something that will make me feel better. Actually, let's go to Second Timothy, and that's the last scripture I'm going to consider. Second Timothy chapter four, and now we're going to read verses one to eight. And let me read them right quickly. Second Timothy chapter four, verses one to eight, and says, "I, Paul, charge thee, Timothy, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearance and His kingdom, preach the word." Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And here's the prophecy. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teacher, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch, 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 watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Those are the three things the watchman gotta do. Fought a good fight, finish the course, and keep the faith. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus Christ. And last verse, eight. Henceforth, there is laid upon or for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also that love is appearing. Our reward is huge. As watchmen, we have received eternal life in Christ Jesus, the forgiveness of all our sins. We've been washed anew in the blood of Christ. We've been reconciled with the Father through the death of Jesus on the cross. By His Christ, we were healed. By His resurrection, we're justified or declared righteous in the eyes of God through Jesus. We have a mediator between God and us, which is Jesus. We have a comforter, a counselor. The helper, the Holy Ghost, which was sent for us, who indwell in us, so we understand the will of God, so we get boldness in the time of trial, so we have strength where we are weak, so we have vision we have lacking, so we can pray to God even when we cannot pray because we suffer so much. He translates this wrongness of the spirit of ours and takes it into incense to God of a sweet savor. Our faith has got to be strong. Our faith got to be hardened. Our foreheads will be hardened because Paul told us to put on the whole armor of God to have the gel of salvation, the breastplate of faith, the shield of faith. The, the feet shod with the good news of the gospel. 
and be quick with the sword of God, the sword of the Spirit, the Bible, by meditating, praying, reading, applying unto our lives. We understand the will of God and we can show the people the way to God, which is through Christ Jesus. Watchmen sound alarm, the time is coming. The time of the age of the church is almost over. Don't delay. Don't find excuses. Brother and sister in the church, when the watchmen are telling you things, is to keep you in righteousness so you don't fall or you don't veer away from the will of God or you don't drift away or be seduced by false doctrines of devils and men. When we rebuke and, and we reprove, it's because we love you. And we want you to stay in the flock. We fight against false doctrines left and right. Corruption, half-truths, mingle with lies, which are ultimately lies. Because the devil used the truths of the Holy, uh, Holy Word and twisted them to try to ensnare Jesus Christ in his temptations. Don't you think he's doing the same with us? We're living in the time of the wheat and the tears, just like Jesus said. Jesus, the Lord of the field, told him, let them grow together by the fruits, by the fruits you'll know. And he told his helpers, the angels, harvest the wheat and put it in my garners, but the other things burn them. Are you wheat or are you tears? Are you forbearing the counsel? Are you forbearing the gospel? Are you forbearing the admonition or the admonishment for you to put your faith in action now? The elders, the deacons, the, the pastors and the preachers and the evangelists are doing what they can. But you ultimately have to do something. You receive the same gift we receive. We're no better than you. Use it. Try to save people in the name of Jesus. Or at least sow the seeds of the gospel. You don't know what's going to happen. God makes the increase. God will choose who to save or who not to save. It's not my job to determine that. My job as a watchman is to see the world events and to see how the word of God all along for over 3,500 years has been true. That the message of the word of God is alive. That God loves us. But God is holy. And he's going to judge the world with fire. And all the things will be burned in heaven and earth. But God also promised us in Revelation 21 verses 1 to 7. That he promised us new heavens, new earth, and a new Jerusalem. So the people of Israel, of the promise of Abraham... Isaac and Jacob will be restored at the end when they see Jesus Christ coming in their aid during the Armageddon battle. A remnant will say, Baruch Haba B'Shem Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will finally accept Jesus as the Messiah. And after that, and after the thousand years, eternity will, will start and will be one with the Lord. He will be with us, walk with us, commune with us, and we will worship Him. He will be our God and we are His children and people. So watchmen, do the job. Don't fear the times that are coming ahead. Yes, it's going to get worse, but church, be courageous. We overcame the world with Jesus, through Jesus, who overcame the world for us first sound alarm to both the wicked and, uh, and the righteous don't be afraid your reward is great you receive the crown of life the crown of joy and the crown of righteousness but in the end in the end where all things are said and done i want to bow down to my king and cast all my crowns to him lord sound alarm do not be afraid This is a strong teaching, but we need to say it.
we need to say it. declare the word of God whether we like it or not because of the word of God it will come through regardless pondering these things ask God for courage and boldness but get busy now we don't have much time left the end is coming their blood is in your head amen you guys have a great night be blessed and give God glory in all things you do be alert don't fall asleep in your guard whether we live or die we live for Christ and he will reward us 